Morning guys, Dr. Ken Norberg here again with another seminar that I think you're going to find very interesting. <laughs> it's another one in the series about why you didn't see that big buck at your stand site last fall. Uh, the subject of this one is sounds you made, sounds that you might have made that identified you as a dangerous human hunter while stand hunting. And that's not uncommon. And the reason it's not uncommon is because almost everybody makes sounds while stand hunting or uh, during the whole process that can identify you as a dangerous human hunter. And so it's a common reason why that big buck didn't show up last year. He probably did this. Uh, there could be other reasons as well, but this is really an important one. So. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, here's one of my beautiful maps. <laughs> in this case, we got a hunter sitting in a tree stand here. Look, facing out here, and out here is a feeding area. And around him here is this thick woods. Now, that hunter sitting there, here's the wind blowing in this direction, right here. Now. There's a deer, here's a big buck out here in his feeding area, feeding. And he's, this guy is all excited here. <laughs> he probably doesn't dare move right at the moment because the deer is facing in a direction where the, the, the buck would be sure to see him. It doesn't make any difference whether you're sitting six feet above the ground or a ground level or 20 feet above the ground. I mean, they can see 20 feet up just as easy as you and I can. But if you move at this point, Though, even though that buck might have his head down over the ground, he'll spot that motion. He'll see that motion over there. And so you don't want to move while a buck is facing you or even standing broadside because their eyes are over on the side of their head and, and they'll spot that motion. And nowadays when you're hunting big buck, uh, avoiding making motions while that buck can see you is really important. But that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about sounds. Now, you know, when you're sitting here and you have the wind blowing in that direction, that buck can't smell you. It absolutely, it just can't smell you. All your odors are going downwind this way. So, uh, you know, there's three ways a, a buck can identify you. One is by, by sight, seeing you. One is by uh, smelling you and the others by hearing you. Well, if you don't move and you're sitting there and you have a fair amount of cover, especially a good background, a solid, fairly solid background of tree branches behind you uh, and you're sitting there, he's not going to notice you if you're sitting very still. But the minute you move, that's different. So you can fool a whitetail's eyes by how well you conceal your your silhouette and movements while you're still hunting. Uh, so you can fool a whitetail's eyes. Uh, and as far as odors are concerned, you can be absolutely certain the buck you'd like to take can't smell you by being downwind or crosswind of where the, what we expect to see the buck uh, when you're stand hunting. So uh, you can fool uh, uh, a whitetail's nose really easily by just being downwind or crosswind of where the deer is. But sound is different. It doesn't matter where the buck is or how much cover you have around you. A buck can hear all kinds of sound, even sounds of little mice running through the leaves and squirrels running across a down tree out in the woods up to 200 yards away on a quiet morning in every direction, completely around the deer, every direction. In other words, if you make a sound here that convinces the buck, oh, there's a human over there and that tree over there where that tree is, I better get out of here, you can't fool his, you can't fool his ears. In fact, <clears throat> even when a whitetail is bedded, they don't sleep long hours like humans. About every 15 minutes they wake up. 
and they check around, sniff the air, listen, and if it's all is quiet, not, nothing to worry about, back to slumbering again, or while they're chewing or cutting or whatever. But even while they're sleeping, their ears are always working. And if their ears pick up sound that suggests something dangerous is approaching or passing, that deer will wake up instantly. His ears will wake him up. So you can't fool a whitetail's ears very easily. There's ways to do it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But keep in mind, you know, a whitetail can hear you 24-7 all the while you're in the woods. And if they can hear you 200 yards away, you know, on a quiet morning, they can. There's a lot of sounds you can make. They'll hear you that far away. They won't worry about you, or even a hundred yards away, as long as there's dense cover between you, you and the deer, that deer won't worry about you, because hearing you way over there, hundred yards away. It can't see you, but he can hear you, and he knows you're there. So, but anyway, that's one of the reasons stand hunting is still the best way there is to hunt older bucks. You know, stand hunting forces you to sit still in one place for hours at a time and during that time you're going to be silent or relatively silent or you should be and uh, for that reason um, you, you can be fooling his eyes ears and, and nose all three of his senses at the same time because you're not moving you're really silent up there and uh, you're in as long as you're uh, downwind of the deer it's not going to smell you as well there is no other hunting method that you can use that provides you with all those advantages. That's why stand hunt is still the best way there is to hunt older bucks. But the way most hunters do it nowadays, they ruin those advantages. Uh, you can do that. You can stand on all your life and never see a big buck just by making sounds alone. And uh, we'll get into that a little more here in a bit, but keep that in mind. You know, most hunters will do a pretty good job of avoiding being smelled. And they use all kinds of products to reduce the, your odors, which is always a good idea when you're hunting whitetails, especially older bucks. But you can't depend on those products to continue keeping you scentless for a long period of time. In fact, within an hour, you're your body is producing more and more odors that go downwind. They spread vertically as well as horizontally and they touch the ground downwind of your stand site. No matter how high you are up above the ground, your odors get down there and, and spread to a huge area. And uh, if you move uh, while you're up there, you might not see the deer when you move the deer. Uh, when you move, you might, there might be cover here and there and he's standing behind the bush and oh, that's not moved over there. You're done. But but when it comes to hearing, it doesn't matter. It can be all kinds of stuff between you and the deer. And keep that in mind. Let's say you hunt in an area where there's 20 to 30 deer per square mile. And there's lots of places like that. Now, uh, my daughter and her husband, my oldest daughter and her husband, hunt in Michigan every year. They, uh, my, they have uh, privately owned land there with lots of deer on it. and. Uh, uh, there's 30 deer per square mile now. They see all kinds of deer while they're standing. But they have yet to take a big buck there. <laughs> and that's pretty typical of hunters all over the United States, whitetail hunters. Uh, you might see a lot of deer wherever you hunt. And probably more of them if you're stand hunting, although you know, guys making drives will see a lot of deer as well. But hardly anyone. Uh, who hunts any other way will have opportunities to take big bucks during the hunting season. So stand hunting is still the best way to go, but you know, one of the things like, like here's a trail, this hunter goes to the stand and between him and where the deer is out here, let's say it's dark out there, you get out there really early and gee, the deer are out here feeding in this feeding area. As long as you have lots of cover hiding you, on the way to the stand, and they can't identify you by a sight. They might see something move over there, but it might be a squirrel or a bird, you know, nothing that that gives them a uh, 
absolute evidence or, uh, that you are a human, uh, you're pretty well covered all the way to the span side. Maybe these trees are tall enough here so that when you're climbing up there, you, they don't see you climbing up there as well. You get up into your stand and they still haven't seen you. And then you sit down and then you're quiet for the next 30 minutes and pretty soon those deer start moving around again out here. But no matter what you do, they're going to hear something. And uh, there's things you can do about preventing, about goofing up or ruining your chance to take a big buck by a sound you make or don't make. So, but anyway, uh, you got lots of cover here that helps you get there. And now you're sitting in the stand and pretty soon it's getting light and here's this big buck out in front of you. And that's what we all dream of and every now and then it'll work. It'll work more often if you're more careful about avoiding sounds that absolutely identify you as a human. Keep in mind when you're stand hunting, uh, as long as the deer out in front of you, in, you know, in the area of your stand site, can't positively identify, they can't be sure what you are by sounds you make, they won't run away. They'll stay there. They'll be curious, what is that? What's that sound? What's coming in my direction? What, what's making those really soft footsteps? Um, and they're going to, maybe if they think that, gee, uh, it's kind of human-like, they might walk over and, and stand in cover uh, behind it and wait and listen. And, and they're smelling, they're checking scents in the air. And, in, in some cases, a really big buck out there, and he's kind of smart about things like that. He's going to say, I don't like this. I'm going, to, I'm, going to go, I'm going to go up around here and get downwind of that, whatever it is, and get a sniff of it to make sure I know what it is. There are bucks that do that. Even does. I've had does do that to me. Uh, I knew they were there. I could see them moving out there, but gee, they were looking right toward me. And I didn't know if I had moved previously, and that's what caught their attention. But they were looking at me and looking at me, and pretty soon they disappear. Then later on, when it was time to head back to camp for lunch, I walked back to the trail behind me that I came in on, and here those, there were two does. They had walked right on my tracks, and they got up downwind of me, and I could see where they stopped and were standing, looking in the direction of where I was, and they could absolutely smell me from there. And then they knew, yep, that was a human, all right. And then they went way around me again and got around the other side. Well, bucks, big older bucks do that a lot. Some bucks are really good at that, so keep that in mind. But anyway, uh, but as long as they can't I be sure of what you are, they're going to hang around you. They're not going to leave the area. They might hide a little bit. Some of them might just stop where they are. Where they, well, there's something out there. Maybe it's a squirrel or something. And they, they aren't going to hide. They'll just stand there for... Uh, frozen for maybe 15 to 30 minutes. I've had deer do that for 30 minutes. It's amazing. So, and some I watch them so long, I wonder, is that really a deer? It looks like a deer. It hadn't moved in 30 minutes and then finally started moving. They can be quite patient about trying to figure out what was that, what we heard coming or approaching or passing. And that's important to deer. And until they positively identify you, they say, oh, that's a human, all right. You move or something, or you make another sound, or they get a whiff of you because you're not downwind or crosswind over there, then they know, and then they'll go. But if they can't, and then you're really quiet for 30 minutes, at the end of that 30 minutes, they'll start doing whatever they're doing. They're maybe if they're bedded, they'll remain bedded real close and chew their cuds, or if they're feeding, they'll remain in that area and start feeding, and they'll start ignoring you. Once in a while, they might raise their head and look over there, and no, oh, nothing there, and go back to feeding. But that's typical of whitetails. Because whitetails don't use up a lot of extra energy running away every time they suspect, merely suspect, something dangerous might be near whether it's caused by a, a human or a wolf or a black bear, until they know it's a human, wolf, or black bear, they won't run away. So, come on now. 
And counting on it, that should really influence what you do when you're going to a stand site because you won't see it happening. You won't hear it happening unless all of a sudden, oh yeah, it's a human out of there. We better get out of here. And they might run away and snorting and make a boy. And then you know you goofed up. You really goofed up. Uh, they saw you, clearly saw you were a human when you were coming or heard you or smelled you. So then you really goofed up. But if it, stays, if it remains quiet, all where you stand, nothing has happened, and you're doing things properly, you can say, they're still out there. So, about time it gets first minute of the first legal shooting hour of the day begins, 30 minutes before sunrise, there they'll be. So, anyway, if they aren't there, well, there can be reasons for that, but more than likely, if they aren't there, you goofed up somewhere there, getting to your stand. What, the way you walked, or the sound you made, uh, what, they maybe saw you climbing up into the tree, and so on. Now look at that, there's a human going right up that tree. Uh, or when you're up there, you, you might have made a lot of other sounds that we're going to talk about in a little bit that tells the deer, yep, yeah, that's a human, all right, we better get out of here. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, but making, uh, humans, uh, nowadays, you know, most hunters are not really concerned about noises they make. Well, you might be a little concerned, you know. You're automatically doing the right thing once you get into the tree, but getting there without alarming that buck or alerting or alarming that buck is going to be kind of hard if you don't know what you're doing. So, but a lot of hunters feel like, well, one of the things they like to do to avoid being identified by deer when they're walking on foot in the woods is to, what most of it's been taught, my dad taught me that, my uncles taught me that, oh, walk, sneak, and stop every few feet and look around, and they, t they told me, now you're, when you do that you sound like a deer that's feeding because they stop while, while they're feeding and they won't worry about you. But that's just not true. There's so many reasons why you can't fool a deer into thinking you're another deer by stopping often while you're heading to a stand site. All kinds of reasons. For one, uh, most of the deer that you hunt, when you're hunting, uh, that are feeding, and they start, they get up from their beds at four in the morning and when you go out there in the morning, they're already out here. You know, on first light, here's the deer, they're still feeding out there in that feeding area. When they feed, they're in a feeding area where there's the kind of foods that are currently available that they really like, you know, like uh, grasses or certain kind of leaves or maybe after the the first week in November and they're feeding on browse, certain browse plants like where I hunt uh, red osiers and, uh, and suckers growing off of stumps of sugar maple trees. They're red too and they love those. They're out there in that area and over here if there's none of those kind of plants growing there and they hear something coming and it stops off and it's not because they're feeding, because there's nothing, the those favorite foods that they normally feed on there, they're all out here. If they heard something, they couldn't see, you know, maybe there's bushes here and there moving like that out in the feeding area, they would probably just think right away, oh, that's just another deer, or maybe a moose. And we have moose in our hunting area. They might say, well, it's one of those and don't have to worry about that, but we'll keep an eye on things here just in case it's a wolf or a bear or a human. But when they hear that kind of sounds coming from something big enough to make, to step on twigs that break, snap fairly loudly underfoot, they're coming in, they're stopping off, and that gets to be kind of scary. What then? Now, there are any deer feeding in there, what is that? Well, if a deer is alerted by you, you know, let's say there's one over here and he was going to go out there to feed and he heard you making noises when you're going by, he said, oh, that's a human, or he saw you when you went by, so I, I think I better move away a little bit and I'll head out this way. If he's, when he's moving away, most deer, if you do it properly, 
aren't going to run either. Yeah, you know, it can, you can see a lot of deer while you're heading to a stand site. If you do it properly, they aren't going to bound away, all excited, snorting and bounding and crashing through the brush. They're going to sneak away, and they're going to stop off and then listen to see where you are. And, and oh, so it's still going this way. Well, I'm going to keep going this way. If a deer is out, if the deer is out here and they hear that kind of movement in that area, they're thinking maybe that's another deer. All right. But the way it's, because it's moving the way it is, stopping off and uh, it's been alerted by something, something dangerous. Maybe the thing we're wondering, you know, we hear these sounds, we're wondering if it's him. There's a deer over there acting like it's sneaking away and trying to keep track of where that hunter's going while it's doing. That deer has, has determined this thing that's on this trail is dangerous. So that's one of the reasons why, why if you stop off and you might be just convincing some deer ahead that there's something dangerous all right there because there's something, it sounds like a deer moving and stopping off and out there in that area where there's no food. Uh, that, that thing that we're hearing must be dangerous all right. It might have the opposite effect on deer than you think that you're, you're having. Then there's other reasons, you know. Your feet are much bigger than whitetail feet. They're big. Whitetail's hoof print. Here's a picture. See this? Uh, see how much bigger my my footprint is compared to the deer that stepped into the footprint? Now, and then I'm wearing these heavy boots and with thick soles, you know, and wherever I step, I can't tell when I'm stepping down on a, a branch or a twig, a, a dead one, that's going to go snap when I step on it. I can't tell that. But a deer, you know, the outer part of the hoof might be as hard as rock, but underneath the leathery part on the bottom side of the hoof uh, can feel things that it steps on. And if a deer is walking through the woods and he's starting to press down on something that might snap loudly like that, a deer that wants to be quiet you know, it doesn't want to attract attention, well, take his foot away from them, put it down one side or the other. And consequently, white tail, with their smaller feet and the ability to feel what they're stepping on, aren't going to break a lot of twigs when they're walking through the woods. You know, I've watched black bears. You know, I remember the biggest bear I ever shot. I was sitting in a tree stand, and it was about 10 feet up, and, uh, Older, big trophy class back black bears are really smart about people using bait to attract a bear to a stand site nowadays. And uh, one of the things that an older bear is likely to do is circle your bait site widely. You know, maybe out of sight while they're doing it. In this case, it was, I could see the bear doing it. He was going through an elder swamp, you know, interlacing elder. Uh, tree trunks and branches all over the place. Boy, a human can't go through an elder swamp silently with all this stuff climbing through there and trying to keep out of deep pools of water. But this bear was there. He was, he was, if you weren't looking in the direction where that bear went by, you would have never known it was there. You couldn't hear it while we're doing it. But what they like to do is circle it and then check your trail sense going to the stand site or your bait site to see how fresh your trail sand is, and it's relatively fresh, they won't come in. But the point is, when a bear wants to be quiet, he lifts his feet up, up well above the ground, and puts his feet down lightly, his paws. And it looks almost like they're swimming <laughs> when they're going through an elder swim. You know, if you're an experienced deer hunter, you know a deer can suddenly appear in your, near your stand site as silently as a puff of smoke. And you know, amazingly, a big bull moose with big antlers can move through dense cover silently. And what they're doing is they're deliberately lifting their feet clear the ground, putting their hoofs down lightly on the ground. And you can't even hear them. How in the world? That's really amazing. Now, I've watched deer and bear, and uh, 
uh, moose doing that often enough to know what they were doing wasn't the way they normally walked. In each case, that animal was deliberately picking its hoofs up well clear on and putting them down real lightly as they walked. Now, during the 25 years I put on a buck and bear hunting schools in northern Minnesota, half the time spent in the woods with, with 20 guys um, um, where I could show them everything they needed to know to be more successful at taking older bucks. And one of the things I often did while we were walking through the woods is a uh, single file, a whole bunch of guys like a wolf pack, I'd step aside and listen to their footsteps as they were walking by. And those footsteps those guys made were really distinctive compared to footsteps of almost anything else whitetails will hear in the woods. Here's a strip of leaves along this old forestry trail. I'm going to walk on it like the, the average guy, including me. Now, you see, you hear that noise? If those leaves are dry, they're, they're kind of dew covered this morning. They'd be crackling as well. And one of them is, they almost all were dragging their heels. You hear that scraping sound, their heels being dragged. You know, us humans, uh, nowadays we're used to walking on flat surfaces without anything laying there, We've got nice flat smooth surfaces to walk on, without any reason to be quiet about it, silent about it. We don't, we don't sneak around their houses being quiet normally. And, <laughs> and uh, we don't have to lift our feet more than about a half inch to an inch uh, to clear the floor so we aren't dragging our heels. But you put on those big heavy boots and you're out in the woods and especially if you've been walking for a little while, you're going to be dragging your heels. And you don't feel what you're stepping on when you're stepping down. So you're not only dragging your heels, but you're stepping on twigs that break, snap audibly as you walk along. And whitetails and moose and bears all know that any creature that walks through the woods making scraping sounds, you know, dragging their feet in there on the ground and or even in leaves, you know, deer and moose will make dragging sounds in the, you know, leaves that say there's three inches of leaves on the ground, dried leaves, they're going to be swishing too, but the swishes they make with each step are short, you know, this little swish. When a human comes along, it's swish, swish, swish from planet to track. That's a human sound. So it doesn't matter what kind of an animal it is, a moose, bear, or deer, or a squirrel. And when they hear that kind of footsteps coming to her, lots of squishing, uh, dragging of heels on gravel, hard snow, um, and leaves, whatever, whatever you're walking on, and snap often, twigs snapping on your foot. It can only be a human. So you can walk, all, stop all you want, all the way to a stand side, often. Go oh, four or five steps and stop and listen and look around. You're not fooling those deer and thinking you're uh, another deer feeding because of all the noise your feet are making. You might not even notice it. You know, it's so normal, that happens all the time. You know, you don't even notice you're making these sounds, but you are. So I used to talk to my students at my high school a lot about this. What you have to learn to do is, is walk like a bear or a deer or a moose that is alerted, is trying to move silently for one reason or another through the woods. And the way you have to do it, each with each step, you have to bend your knees. You can't do it by just walking stiff-legged. You've got to bend your knees with each step and put them down lightly with each step. And so you aren't dragging your heels. And um, I could talk myself blue about this. And we get out in the woods, and these guys are going, listen to all the <laughs> heel dragging going on in the woods. It was terrible. So. That's a reason, another reason, another way a whitetail, this buck out here in this feeding area, knows you're a human. When you're dragging your heels and stepping on a lot of twigs all the way to your stand site, that's a human. I mean, he's going to go. Yeah, when the 
when the uh, at half hour will be sure of sunrise, and you look out there, there's no deer. Where's all the deer? You expected to find a deer. There are a lot of fresh tracks made by that buck uh, before the hunting season or uh, hours before, like, like, let's say you found fresh tracks on a trail of a deer heading toward the feeding area uh, at between 11 and 12 midday. This is when we, temp we usually look for tracks like that on, on our stand side of post trails or on the great big oval shirt cruise trail we establish every year, uh, connecting deer trails going through every square mile area we hunt in the woods. And all these uh, stand side approach trails attached to that. They all, you know, but we look for signs all the time. And gee, let's say at noon you found these fresh tracks of a big buck, big four inch tracks, and maybe some droppings an inch long uh, are going across your, your trail here. And he was heading that way. And why is that buck wasn't wasn't and didn't have reason to uh, move rapidly away or even sneak rapidly away? Uh, you didn't alarm that deer in this area in the morning. There's a good opportunity, good uh, chance that deer is going to return to that feeding area in the evening. And uh, then you get out there in the evening and he doesn't. What happened? Something happened. Uh, maybe the deer in the afternoon smell the doe and heat way over there somewhere. They can smell them a mile away and it might be way over there somewhere. But each doe is only in heat for 24 to 26 hours. So uh, that happens. Yeah, that, but let's say it worked out really well. Let's say this buck was with a doe when he went out there. Or maybe you found the tracks where they were coming away from there. And you say, oh, they were feeding out here this morning and they went and just... Here's their tracks. So there's a good chance they're going to come back in the evening and you get out there, no deer. What happened? Something's wrong. That, that, you, that, doe, that buck should be with that doe for another 12 hours. So maybe he'll be back in the morning, come back in the morning and still within the 24 hour period that doe is in here. And you go to your stand site really carefully, you out. no, nothing out there. What happened? Something alerted those deer or told those deer you are a stand hunter and you sit here. <laughs> Something told them that, so that's why they didn't come back. Well, anyway, uh, so now you know, well, there's other sounds that deer make when they're feeding, uh, especially in November in gun season. Well, even earlier, let's say they're eating grass out here. Now, deer don't have upper front teeth. You know, it's not like they go, reach down and go crunch like that and bite the grass off. What they usually do is get a mouthful and rip it off and stand up and chew on it, get it down. That, if you're close to a deer that's feeding on grass, you hear that. Uh, after the first week in November, we, where we had all the deer are eating twigs of, of woody shrubs and young trees. They're eating those. Uh, the woody stems, and called browse. And they can't bite it off. Usually they'll get a hold of it and break it off. And you know, if you're listening, you know, you're at your stand site, and let's say you have a browse area out in front of you, and it might be kind of thick, all kinds of bushes, you know, growing up. They could be covered with a second growth poplar or, or whatever. But there's a lot of this, those shrubs that the whitetails like to feed on when they're feeding on browse out there. And you hear, you'll hear a soft twig snap over here. And you'll wonder about that. I mean, there's not usually squirrels out there or things like that, you know. When I hear one of those, and I might not hear anything for another minute or two, but right away I'm alerted. Now, was that a deer breaking off a woody stem of browse that made that sound. Now listen, it was, oh, another one right over here. And it's moving in that direction. And another one there. I've sat out in places like that, and for two hours I hear this progression of this soft snap of a browse stem being break, broken off by a deer feeding on browse. And never saw it. 
<laughs> you know, so, but once in a while I'll be watching in that dress. Oh, I saw something move there. It's got antlers. So you just get my scope up and I'm looking for an opening. Oh, it's heading in this way. There's a little opening ahead of it. And that might be it right there. And he gets into that opening. Pow. You know, I've shot quite a few deer and bucks under circumstances like that. So when you hear soft twig snaps, don't ignore them. I remember one morning I was sitting <laughs> at a stand said, boy, it was a long hike out there in the dark and I had to be careful to go around a big hill rather than over it because I didn't want to be skylighted on the way there, you know, against the starlit sky in the morning. Boy, they see you move up there when you're going over the top every time. And I used to be a doe over in that area that would go crazy every time she caught you skylighted in the dark an hour before sunrise. <laughs> He'd be starting and starting and just ruin the whole thing, the whole area. You might as well go back to camp. But at any rate, they go make do all these things to get to your stand site from crosswind or down downwind and keeping the heavy cover so you aren't readily seeing your body, your silhouette readily seen. Finally get there and uh, you, and you get to your stand site. And this particular morning I was using my stool and then my stand site was at ground level and I was sitting behind a a pile of down trees. And it was a good spot to be sitting in. And I was sitting there and watching, uh, uh, you know, the breeze was coming toward me and I was watching in that direction, looking off in this direction. Well, shortly after first light that, that morning, a grouse, there was plenty of snow on the ground, about a foot of snow, and the grouse commonly will burrow in snow, and then when it's really cold, and they'll come up out of that burrow in the snow and brush the snow off and fly up in the top of big aspen trees out there that feed on aspen buds in the area we hunt. They love, you know, quaking aspen buds in the wintertime. But anyway, so I was sitting there and there's a this grouse flew up in a tree right up behind me. And uh, I looked at it a couple times and there was tiptoeing along these branches that were bedding up there and picking buds, you know. And I was sitting there, um, you know, after a bit, you know, you know that grouse is certainly making a lot of noise and said breaking, actually breaking twigs up there. But grouse don't usually do that. It's really funny. And I turned my head when it did that. There was a big <laughs> ten pointer standing about twenty yards away, looking right at me. Big buck, nice buck. That holy cow! I <laughs> got my gun around. And as I started to move it, one leap and it went down a steep embankment down in this area. We call that teacup, that valley. And I couldn't see it again until it was bounding up. Way on the other side, it was just glimpses. And I, and so I missed my chance to take that big buck. And if, if I'd been paying attention to those louder sounds of, of, of twigs being broken, they would have known, hey, there's a deer feeding on brows over this way, and if I turned my head before it got up to where I could see its antlers coming up that hillside, oh, it would have been an easy shot. It would have gotten a big buck easy, but I wasn't paying attention. So sometimes those little twig snaps, even though a deer don't normally step on things that break loudly on your foot, can be the sign that there's a deer browsing in that area and you hear a succession of that. It might be a little while before you hear another one and, oh, he's over there now. But keep that in mind. Good thing to know. You know, there's things that can help you, you know, like if you're going to a stand site. Uh, we have a string of stand sites along a stream in our hunting area. It's rushing over rocks, you know, white water, just really a lot of racket come from that stream and along one long stretch of where we hunt. And that sound is a good one for, for hiding your footsteps. Doesn't mean you should be careless there, but you're much more likely to get to your stand site without alerting deer in, a, in an adjacent feeding area when you got something like that happening. Now strong winds can do that as well. Problem with strong winds is that when winds are exceed 15 miles an hour, there's so much racket in the woods that it really becomes difficult for deer to, to be able to hear uh, potentially dangerous things like a bear or a wolf or a human coming toward them. 
And when the winds are really strong, they won't, they'll even skip a feeding cycle. They'll just stay in their beds in really thick cover uh, when it's like that. All through feeding, if it's blowing hard in the morning you get up there, you probably won't see a deer the whole time you're there. Or if it's blowing real hard in the evening. And it doesn't have to be a steady wind either. It can be gusting really loud. And that'll, that deer won't move when it's like that. A, a snowstorm, you know, blizzard going on, it can last a couple days even sometimes. That can suppress those sounds. But it, there again, deer are likely to stay in their beds the whole time this is going on. And uh, so there's things that can suppress your footsteps while you're going to stand sites, but you can't count them. That might be a rare thing where you hunt, so you have to be careful. So let's get back to talking about walking softly. Now, being it's not a normal thing for you to walk softly, trying to be silent when you're walking through the woods, you have to work at it. You know, I know every year I get up there, the first time I head out, I have to keep my mind on what, how I'm walking because before you know it, I'll be dragging my heels and telling every deer that can hear me ahead of me, here comes a human. So you have to work at bending your knees and putting your feet down lightly. And uh, I've read some accounting about hunters from way back, like, American Indians hunting and the way they would walk in the woods and even move rapidly by lifting their feet up and putting their feet down lightly and they could move pretty fast through the woods if they needed to without making easily heard sounds. And of course they had, their feet were bare or covered with buckskin uh, moccasins so they could feel what they were stepping on as they went so they could be really quiet. But we can't do that. And we have those big boots we wear. But anyway, um, but it takes practice. And usually I have to be thinking about it all the time, morning and afternoon, for at least two days before it starts to become automatic for me. Every year I have to go through this training process of walking softly. Now, that is one way to fool the ears of a whitetail up to a point. If you're breaking a lot of twigs while you're doing it, you're not fooling them anymore. But let's say here's this buck out here, and he hears you breaking twigs now and then, coming in. You can still fool him. <laughs> and this was taught to me by wolves. Now, I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to go into great detail about it. But it absolutely works. When wolves don't want to alarm deer along the way when they're searching for vulnerable prey, they walk softly <laughs> at a moderate pace along a special trail, one of their cruise trails, one of the trails they use to find fresh odors, you know, trail scents, or even sea deer along the way. Uh, and, and finally select one, they think this is one we can catch. Um, and they will do it, they'll select deer along the way without stopping and racing after them. They don't usually do that because, you know, wolves, big even the big 12 wolf pack, uh, wolf packs with 12 wolves in it, are not successful at just breaking into a run and charging after a deer and being successful at taking those deer in only about one in five times. And you know, that's a lot of hard running. Now usually they'll end up, finally give up with their tongue and the deer have an advantage because they can jump over things, the wolves gotta go around them. So anyway, uh, wolves learn that if they walk a certain way, even if they're identified by the deer, <clears throat> as long as they, those deer think those wolves have no interest in them whatsoever, they can pass by them and a wolf, a uh, deer they've selected, and then uh, right by them, and they'll just stand there and look at and watch go by because they're not hunting or not acting interested in, in them at all. Those wolves learn that if they stop and start sniffing, oh, a fresh deer scent, and boy, oh, these are interesting, and that deer is standing over there seeing them do it, that deer is going to go. It knows 
it's been selected as a prey. It's going to get out of here. Or if those wolves start chasing it right, of course, then he knows that it's been selected as a prey too, and it's going to go like crazy and get out of there. If the wolves, a single wolf or a pack, they walk along and they stop every few steps and look around, sniff the air, and listen, they're hunting. And that deer over there, seeing that, that's scary. He's going to sneak away. He doesn't want to get there. He doesn't want to attract their attention. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to sneak away. Um, uh, if if they, the wolf suddenly changed direction, they're walking along this trail, all of a sudden they go off the trail in the direction of the deer. Maybe, you know, humans do that a lot. They're walking along, and, oh, I think I'll go over this way. When they do that, and there's a deer bed over there, and that deer was saying, gee, as long as it keeps going that way, I'm safe. But boy, when that hunter turned and started going toward him, that's a different situation. And you, a lot of hunters think, boy, am I ever good at that because I jumped deer and on and they didn't hear me until I got pretty close. And they, but they ran real fast and it was, I shot a few times and missed them and in that heavy timber. And, but a lot of hunters don't even know a deer is near until that deer breaks and starts bounding away. But the minute you start heading in their direction or just stop and look at them, and you might not even know there's a deer over there, you're just looking over that way and wondering if there's a deer over there. And uh, you know, where if you got very deer per square mile, it's, it's almost certain when you stop and do that, there's going to be deer seeing you do it. And when they do that, they know you're interested in deer, you're hunting deer, and that's going to ruin your, it can ruin your stand site. By the time you get to stand site, this might have happened so often, whether it's in the dark or in daylight, that by the time you get there, your chances of taking a big buck there are zero because of the way you act. But if you keep your head pointed straight ahead, walk straight there without breaking, without stopping for any reason along the way, just keep going straight by, looking straight ahead as if you're totally uninterested deer. I don't, you don't care how many deer there. Just keep walking softly. And just keep going until you're out, you're outside and you finally get that heavy cover leading to your stand site where they can't even see you and there's deer out there in that feeding area and you climb up or you sit down at ground level uh, hidden by natural cover, which I think is the best thing. But at any rate, if you're doing all that, but moving in that manner, that's the wolf roost. Boy, they do that a lot and that really helps them to take deer on. But if you're using the wolf roads while walking to a stand site or leaving it, or in the midday walking around that oval area looking for fresh deer signs, if you do walk that way softly, that way, you aren't going to frighten any deer out of there. They're going to stay in their range. Your chances of seeing deer at your stand site are going to be much improved. Uh, and every day you hunt in the woods when you're doing it, those same deer are there all day long, every day, because you didn't scare them enough to make them abandon their range or become nocturnal, move at nighttime hours only. So two ways, walking softly, and then the other one is walking nonstop, showing no interest in deer whatsoever in anything. You just go straight through as if you're only interested in getting over to some destination way over there somewhere. That's all you want to do. Nothing, you deer have nothing to worry about. Here I go. You can pass all kinds of deer in the woods. And even if you stopped a lot, you wouldn't see most of the deer. They're using cover in their natural camouflage. It, uh, you, you just won't see them. They're frozen, just standing there, you don't see anything moving. You, but you've done damage by doing that while going to your stand site. You know, I, I think I mentioned a while back, I had a chance down in New Orleans at a SHOT Show one year to sit down and talk with Fred Bear for a while. And that was really fun talking to that man. If you never heard of Fred Bear, look him up on the internet. But he's world famous for, as a bow hunter. 
And uh, I was really happy to hear him say that, you know. He never stops on the way to stand side. Goes straight there, gets that done with. If you if you stop often, you're ruining a, you're ruining your chances to get a deer when you get to the stand site. Just get that part done with. Get to the stand site and get up there, and then sit still for the rest of the time. Meanwhile, all these deer that you pass are going to stay in the area, and your chances that some of those are going to end up in front of you at your stand site are then pretty good, really good. And if you're hunting big bucks, it's just almost imperative that you walk softly, non-stop, to your stand site if you want a chance to take a big buck. So, there you go. That's kind of important. But, one more thing. There are a lot of other sounds you can make, you know, besides your footsteps, that can tell you whether you're a human. And it'll add, gives you that deer absolute evidence, if it's an older experienced deer. I mean, a fawn or a yearling might mistake you, but, uh, there's lots of things. See, like when you're walking, if you got loose chain, your keys, or bullets in your pocket and they're jingling. I, I, I've got a strap on my favorite rifle. If the sling swivels get dry, I have to oil them every year a little bit so it doesn't, they'll squeak. they squeak <laughs> every once in a while. Uh, and those deer are not fooled, but that's a metallic sound, any metallic sound. Like, um, uh, you know, maybe putting a shell in your gun or, or uh, pulling back the receiver on your automatic and letting it go so you got a bullet in the chamber and you're out in the woods. Or you're sitting in your tree and you pull the hammer back on your lever action rifle or press the safety forward on your bolt action and it goes click. It's almost, dear old, older deer, especially older bucks, will react as if they just got stung by a bee. Some of them won't hesitate. They'll just whirl around and bound away, starting this boy. That metallic sound was just terrible. You know, if you're carrying a tree stand that's rattling all the way to your stand, and then you 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 you're lopping off branches and hauling that in the tree and strapping it to the tree and getting steps on there on the tree and all the things you need to get up there. Holy cow! All that noise. You know, that's almost like your tree stands that ends up being like a booth at the Midway of State Fair with all the racket and things. Then if you get up there, you know, then while you're climbing up there, if your clothing is brushing against rough bark or birch bark on the way up, it's making that sound. There's nothing in the woods that makes that kind of noise. Only a human, an older deer, experienced white tail, that's definitely a human who would make that noise. You know, and all that chopping and sawing and all that kind of thing you might do. These guys get out there, they got to have a, 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 a shooting lane. If you're a decent shot, you don't need a shooting lane. It's just an opening six inches wide. It's plenty. And if you got two, three, four of them around there, here's an opening there and one there and one there. That's all you need. You don't need a big wide avenue to shoot unless you're an awful hunt, awful marksman. You just kind of imagine being that awful that you have to have look like a bulldozer path going through the woods to fire through and hope a deer walks across it because that and a lot of other things like middle lumber and all kinds of destruction trees cut down and shooting lines made and and uh, two by fours fresh two by fours made in trees and all those kind of things the buck comes like oh and he smells all the trail scent that you made and all the monkey business you did around that stand site when you built it, boy, just full of human trail set, all over, big concentration. All over, that scent lasts for four days, and if a buck walks up into that area four days before hunting season, from that time on already, he's going to be avoiding that area and probably for the rest of his life. If, I, the more, more changes you make in the woods, the more unnatural those changes are, the more likely it is a buck is going to spot them before you even get a chance to see them. Now, during the hunting season, you have to keep this in mind. You know, this is another subject, but always keep it in mind. No deer in the woods is better at, at discovering, identifying, and staying away from you during the hunting season 
than an older buck, a buck three and a half years of age or older. They're all so good at it. And I don't care how, think, how good you think you are at avoiding being seen by a buck or smelled or heard. And that includes me and my sons and I, and we're good at buck hunting, and we take a lot of big bucks, and we're especially good at them. But we've learned over the years that If you're truly at the right spot, now what's the right spot? It's a trail or area where you find very fresh tracks and or droppings or maybe a freshly made antler rubber, or freshly made or renewed ground scrape along a trail, but a trail close to a feeding area, adjacent to a feeding area. When you, and the reason I, we always talk about feeding areas is because, you know, you look in, here's a square mile, that's a, buck home range. That's the big dominant buck's home range. He owns a square mile. And there's four or five does living in there and separate little ranges around there and a bunch of other younger bucks, maybe three to five mature bucks, older than the yearlings living in there. Besides, they're all in this, there's trails all over the place. Most of them, most of them made by does and they're young over time. Going different ways to go to different feeding areas in that square mile. And they're all over the place. That buck every day has all kinds of alternate routes it can take to go to a feeding area. But all those trails end up at feeding areas. So feeding areas are concentrate deer during early day, early morning hours and late afternoon hours. So you could go sit by a trail and never see a deer all the whole hunting season at a stand, uh, trail because they're not using it anymore for various reasons. Maybe the wind direction is wrong. Or they know you're there standing sitting in a tree by that trail. They'll go around it. So, But feeding areas concentrate deer movements into limited areas. And while they're there, they're easier to see and they're not running. They're standing there and they're chewing and moving slowly. So that's where you want to be. But you find those signs there. And then if it's a place that offers you good concealment, and, and not only while you're going there, and while you're climbing to a stand or sitting down in natural cover, concealment that's not obvious, everything matches really well in that area, you're in the right place. And that's where you want to be. But if you're in the right place, and we've learned that if you sit there, Everything's perfect for a half day, and you don't see the buck you thought would be there. It means he knows you're there. He's already found you, and he's already avoiding you, and you aren't going to see him there for the rest of this season, and maybe never again. He might, every year he might say, you remember, oh yeah, a human, well, stand on your left sit over there, and I'm not going to, I'm going to watch. The first day of a season, and gunshots in the woods, oh, the season's on. Well, I wanted to go over to that feeding area, but there's that stand site, so he might arrange to walk downwind of it to check to see if you're there. And go, oh, yeah, there you are. <laughs> and bigger bucks do that all the time. And then, so, well, I don't have to worry about him because he doesn't chase deer, he doesn't drive deer, he doesn't stalk deer, he just sits in a tree. Nothing to worry about as long as I keep a safe distance away from them. And that's what he'll do the rest of the hunting season. That's one of the advantages of stand hunting. It's also one of the disadvantages because big bucks will often, I mean maybe 75% of the time, will find you and start avoiding you without your knowledge within the first one to four hours you use a new stand site or an old one for the first time during the hunting season. He's got to get you right away. So if you sit there for a half a day and you don't see him, he already, he's got you. He's got the book on you. He knows you're there. And it's, he's not worried about that because you're a stand hunter. It's the reason my sons and I change stand sites every half day. We used to do it every few days, like a you know, opening week and maybe two or three days later. And then we started learning this about how quickly bucks are at and how good they are at finding them. Well, then we went to 
sitting for a day, you know, two half days in a row, and we started thinking, geez, that, that's happening a lot sooner, and traction snow is telling us, you know. And I, I, would, I would always search for uh, a traction snow that told me this buck found me after leaving a stand site in the morning. That was one of the things I did. I, it was part of my research. And more often than not, sure enough, that darn buck got downwind of me and smelled me. So I had to take care of that stand site. But by changing stand sites every half day, you take that advantage away from older bucks. From that point on, they never know where the heck they're going to find you. In the morning and in the afternoon, they gotta find you first to stay away from you. Some bucks are really good at it. I've known some that were so good at it. It didn't matter where I moved. Every day, that son of a gun would find me, and I'd find the tracks where he's starting to uh, avoid me. And after several days of that, I, I'm wasting my time. Or some bucks, when they realize the hunting season has started, they'll become nocturnal and move at night. And you get out there early in the morning, I'm out there half hour before first, first light, and here's the tracks that buck walk right by my stand here, really fresh. I mean, he's been by here within minutes, or maybe a half hour. And here's my stand site where my trail scent is. He knows I'm here. This is an ambush time. Uh, some are so good that I had some. I found some that used to lay down where I couldn't see them after they found me in the morning, just to keep track of me for the rest of the day. I've had them sit like that, lay down within sight of my buddy Sewer three days in a row, watching where he was sitting, and I didn't know. Re we didn't realize until I happened to walk up in the direction where that buck kept laying down to do that. And I jumped him, and he went across this little trail opening, and big ball, and he was gone, going through heavy cover. But you look at this trip. bed, boy, he's been using that a lot, all smooth and worn down around. He's been, that son of a gun has been watching Silver for three days. And Silver had no chance to take that buck for us. So anyway, that happens a lot, so I keep that in mind. But sounds, you know, like I said in the beginning, you can fool a, a deer's nose by always approaching and sitting down winter where I expect to see a deer. If you get down down winter, you know, well, you've lost that advantage. But if you don't do that, you're losing every day. I don't care what you read or say about things that are supposed to get ready of all your orders. Those are temporary at best and not fully 100 percent effective. But we use them anyway because response to a deer to a hunter that doesn't smell much are much less vigorous than response to hunters who smell a lot. So, you know, it's good not to smell a lot. You know, use them anyway. But uh, everything, the clothing, the sprays, whatever you want. But don't count on them to keep you from being smelled by a deer downwind. And they do it all the time anyway. Uh, within a half day, you got enough orders coming out of you. Every deer in that square mile can identify you from downwind because of it. So, so, uh, so you can fool you can fool a deer's nose. You can't. You can fool a deer's eyes too by using good cover and especially natural, unaltered cover at stand sites like really heavy background of leaves and branches behind you and the sides of you when you're up in the tree, not fully exposed up there. That's terrible nowadays. And do all your shooting from a sitting position, whether you're using a bow or a gun in a sitting position. Position your stand so you're going to shoot over this way and your lower limb is over this way. Thereafter, you can do it that way with the gun as well. But with the gun, you can be face, you can face toward where you expect to see the deer as well. But anyway, uh, you can fool the eyes, but you can't fool their ears. So, you have to work on ways to keep from that, fooling their ears, you know, and do all those other things as well. But this is an important step in becoming more successful in stand hunting. So, never forget that. And don't let anybody talk you out of it, because you start doing this, pretty soon they're going to say, well, geez, 
what are you doing to get all those big bucks? How come you're so lucky? Well, then they're going to listen to you. But until then, it seems like everybody's got a different idea about such things. <laughs> and if it doesn't coincide with what they believe or think or somebody told them, they don't want to believe it. You know, that's a lot of BS or whatever. Uh, I run into that all the time as an instructor. But believe me, uh, what I say is not based on hearsay or a couple of hunting seasons, same thing. Mine is based scientifically on what 80 to 90 percent of deer do under uh, five different behavioral classes whitetails do under similar circumstances over a considerable period of time. Like the rut. I spent 20 years of studying the rut before I finally came out and wrote a book about it, just to be sure. And you know, that's why I can be so sure about what I, what I teach. I don't care what anybody says, I know I'm right. So, but if you want to believe differently, fine, go ahead and keep doing what you're doing. But eventually, you're going to de your deer are going to teach you differently. Eventually, they're going to get so tired of trying to get a big buck, and a lot of guys get too desperate and do it illegally because of it, uh, that you're going to start thinking maybe what Dr. Norman had to say is worth getting serious about. Now, with that, keep in mind this book covers in detail everything I've talked about today. You'll find that material in here. And so, you know, a year from now when you're getting ready to go and you're thinking, no, gee, what have I got to do to get ready this year? I got a big buck out there. I got a photograph with my trail cam or upon its tracks, fresh tracks or droppings. And boy, I'd sure like to get that buck this year. You're going to get this book out and you're going to study it. And the year after that, you're going to, oh, I got another one. It's a little different situation. Or you're going to get this book out and study it again. Honestly, you don't want to go through more hunting seasons doing what you've been doing for years and years and years. Or even if you're just getting started and wondering what to do. You need some kind of a source of information that gives you the straight dope on what you need to know and what you need to do to be successful at taking older bucks. And I don't know, I don't think there's a book anywhere in the world that does that better and provides you with that kind of information better than this book because of the, all the research and time, many years. You know, this represents uh, Studies of wild whitetails going back to 1960, long time. So, what? So that's the book you want to be a buck hunter the rest of your life. One that can be really successful. You know, you might not. There might be years when you don't get one, or many years you say, "Oh, I'm not going to shoot that one. He's a three and a half year old. There's bigger ones out here." And you do that in the end of the season, you might think, "Oh, I should have taken that buck." There can be years you won't get one. And uh, where I am now with the deer population down to three per square mile, it might be several years like that. But normally, you know, with normal deer population of 15 or more per square mile, you should be able to get one almost every year. Certainly 10 or maybe 11 years out of 12 if you're doing what this book tells you to do. How about that? <laughs> so. Don't miss a chance to learn what's in this book and a chance to have a place to, to go back to, to to remind you what you have to do to successfully take big parts. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye again, guys. And uh, before you check off, guys, be sure to hit that subscribe button. It'll only take about two minutes of your time, maybe less. It doesn't cost anything. But it helps me. It, it's a favor to me. And, and that thumbs up button, if you truly appreciate what you've learned today, give me that thumbs up button as well. I appreciate that. that those are important things to being on YouTube. And uh, so I want to keep, keep this up as long as I can. 
So do that for me, will you? And uh, I, you'll find everything you want to find to order this book on my website, dr. Nor dr. Nordberg on drnordberg.com. And go to that, go to the store or whatever, and you'll find the order forms and everything you need. And if you go to my website, not only can you get the book, but you can get a free copy of one of five of my original White Tower Honors Almanacs, which cover one or more different subjects over the years in my research. You can order uh, one of those free. Get a free book. So that's a good deal. <laughs> they they were worth ten bucks in those in all the years I kept making those. So there's five still available. Uh, there's three that are no longer, or four that are no longer available. So, and and people are getting two hundred fifty thousand dollars a copy for used ones on the internet. So they're that valuable to people. So anyway, go to that and you get that extra book along with it. And uh, so, and your wife won't frown so much <laughs> for you spending. 35 bucks for this book. It's kind of expensive, but nowadays you can't even buy a box of bullets for that. So <laughs> that's pretty cheap for the, what it does for you, for you know, for the, the improvement you're going to experience as a buck hunter. So that's, that's a bargain. <laughs> so thanks guys, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.